To what shall I compare the parish family of St. Patrick's? It is like a cottonwood seed. It is the tiniest of little seeds, about a tenth the size of the head of a pin. Released from its pod, it floats on the wind, lingers on the sidewalk, and eventually finds root, where in no time at all it first grows as a sapling, then the branches, growing up to four feet a year. That's a meter and a half for those of you from Canada. <laughs> in no time at all, it becomes the largest of trees in Alaska. Soon, it grows its own pods and sends its seeds upon the wind where they cover the lawns, the sidewalks, affix themselves to screens and find their way indoors. We know not how. <laughs> it's just part of life up here, isn't it? We deal with it. But I am convinced that if there were cottonwood trees in the first century Palestine, Jesus would have used them instead of the mustard seed to illustrate the kingdom of God. Am I wrong? <laughs> now the cottonwood, as you know, is part of the poplar family. They are actually male and female cottonwood trees. They're the first generation tree, uh, as botanists will tell us. Uh, usually the first to sprout up, hold the soil, and provide cover for other flora and fauna after receding, after receding glacier or a wildfire. Now mature cottonwoods can grow over 150 feet tall, have a canopy of 75 feet in diameter, and a trunk over six feet in diameter. But it all starts with that itty bitty little seed. You know the ones I'm talking about. Have you ever done that? You sort of take, you know, you take all the little cotton, you look at the actual seed itself. They are minuscule, tiny. And so I look at the big cottonwood trees that rise up from the ground to the heavens. And then I look at that itty bitty little seed. And I've asked the question before, but I wonder, I wonder, how does it know? How does it know? How does that itty bitty little seed contain everything you need to grow one of those huge trees? Now, any geneticist or botanist can tell you the answer, of course, but if you think about it, in the glory of God's design, it's still pretty incredible that something so huge could come from something so small. And you know, it's the same for us as a parish, as a parish family. We started out so very, very small, about 124 families, carved out of the territory of St. Anthony Parish on the Feast of St. Francis, October 4th, 1971, with a territory which corresponded to the 99504 zip code. And we first took root in Chester Valley Elementary School, affectionately known as St. Chester's of the Valley, yes. <laughs> How many of you were there in St. Chester's at any time? Okay, good, good. We're going to get you on video as they have things get closer. So you need to tell, you need to share your stories. But anyway, then we moved to the Terra Lounge, which is basically was the, found, was the concrete block foundation on which we put the double wide trailer, which the offices sit now 45 years later. And then eventually we went to the Deacon's Hall, and it was paid for by the Great Alaska Pipeline Classic. Now that was pretty cool. I was around for that. And basically it was modeled after the Nanana Ice Classic, and people, for 100 bucks a pop, bought chances on the date, the time, and the when the first barrel of oil would make its way from Prudhoe Bay and arrive at the terminal in Valdez. That's how you paid for that building. It was pretty amazing, pretty creative. And 25 years ago, on May 5th, 1996, we dedicated this building, the new church, as it's known. And now on the eve of 50 years, we have a little over 930 registered families serving in 48 identified mystery, gosh, I did it again, 48 identified ministries within the parish and the local community, all kinds of things. So. If we're going to run the parable of the cottonwood tree to its conclusion, where would we be now in our growth cycle? Remember, the church thinks in terms of millennia. So I would say, while well, we are no longer a sapling, we're still early on in our history. We haven't quite matured as a parish, if you will. But boy, we're getting there. And nevertheless, I believe that we are poised for our next big growth spurt. And how do you do that, though? 
And this is where Father Leo, the organizational theorist, is going to speak to you. The theologian hat we're going to put aside, canon law hat we're going to put over here, and my other degree is organizational theory. And uh, so how do we do that? How do we organize to make our mission? Well, first we have to understand what it is. What's the first thing we do as a parish? What's the first thing that the church does in general, and we do here very specifically, is first that by the joyful and reverent celebration of the sacraments of the church. We fulfill our mission. The, the liturgy evangelizes and it teaches. It is a source and summit of all that we do. It is the first priority of the parish. If you look at our organizational chart, you will see, and you're all going to get a copy of it next week in the bulletin and on the website. In the center and taking primacy of place is all the liturgical ministries and everything that supports that. That's the central pillar on which everything rests. It's the first priority of the parish. And so soon after I arrived, uh, we formed the liturgy committee. And it's made up of all of the coordinators of all the liturgical ministries here in the parish. And we meet about two, three times a year, or as needed, as we, uh, and to plan the liturgical seasons. And you can see, and as you've been here, um, their efforts bear great fruit in the worship of our community, especially uh, during the pandemic, and how flexible and, and these things, and now as we emerge from the pandemic, uh, we can, you know, I look to them a lot and their consultation and their recommendations for what we do in the worship of this community. Second, by the intentional, we do this by the intentional formation of disciples in Jesus Christ. And this was an area that needed some work. And so often we think of faith formation as something for the young people of the parish, don't we? Okay, we start them off in preschool, that's really cool. And then they're in LMA, oh, First Communion, you gotta get that in, of course, you know. And then there's that period, okay, they're kind of learning, oh, then we got confirmation, that sits there. and then, and then, then what? That's not a conclusion, my friends, that is only the beginning. They have the entire, we have our entire life ahead of us after that, once we are fully initiated in the church. So how we form intentional disciples must reflect that lifelong faith formation for everyone in the parish. So, you never stop learning how to be a better disciple. You can never exhaust the mystery of Christ or his church. And as St. Peter says, we should always, each one of us in this room, should always be ready to give an account of the joy that is within us, to be able to articulate that to another. We call it your elevator speech, your 60-second soul saver, whatever. But to help us in this, last July, we, well, actually last year, we formed the catechetical ministries team of all the various catechetical ministries and their coordinators and we got together and we okay what are the opportunities and what are the needs and then we formulated a job description and then we put a position description together and then last, last July we welcomed Mary Allison our new director of catechetical ministries and so in consultation with the same catechetical ministries team Mary has spent the last year evaluating past catechetical programs and developing our new programs of faith formation to meet the needs of all parishioners from nine months to 99 years and beyond. And there are some in this room who are beyond, and they could teach us a thing or two themselves. It's true. So, liturgy, formation of intentional disciples. What's the third pillar on which our parish rests and our mission rests? The third is that the parish evangelizes. And how do we do that? by both ourselves within the parish and then the local community in which we find ourselves. So evangelization has an inward focus and then it has an outreach focus as well. So this is important because if we live this life joyfully and with faith, it will be attractive. And I remember if your entire life is spent bringing only one other person to Christ, just one, is that not a life well spent? If you invite a friend and they come with you to church just because they know you and they trust you and they like the music and the goofy pastor and the deacon is nice to them and they're welcome then they get a donut and then they begin to say okay great I kind of like this Catholic thing I like this Christian thing and they become baptized and then they become confirmed and then they receive their first Eucharist and you help them all the way through the RCIA and they enter into the life of love and knowledge of Christ 
What a marvelous, don't think you won't go without your reward. We're all called to do that. For this pillar of our mission then, this past fall, guess what we did? Yeah, formed another team. The Evangelization and Parish Life Team. It was comprised of all the ministries of evangelization, whether their focus was spiritual, social, or service-oriented. And we looked at the needs and the opportunities before us. And then earlier this year, we developed the position of Director of Evangelization. And we compiled the job description, and we recruited, and we held interviews. And so I'm very happy to announce that on July 1st of this year, we will welcome Miss Emily Brabham as our new Director of Evangelization and Parish Life. And Emily's first task will be to revitalize youth and young adult ministry in the parish while supporting the various other service social and prayer ministries of evangelization within the parish. So, you know, but none of these pillars of our mission, the joyful reverence celebration of the sacraments, the intentional formation of disciples of Jesus, or the evangelization of ourselves and of our neighbors here in 99504, None of those can stand alone. We need a body to consult with the pastor to help discern the needs and opportunities around us and to help with coherent pastoral planning. That's what a pastoral council does. Now notice I use the words very intentionally. It's not a parish council. It's a pastoral council. Their job is pastoral planning. And I am happy to announce that after this, prayer, this uh, period of about three months of discernment that we've been doing, that they will be having their first meeting on the 23rd of June. And so I thank you, all those who participated, and all, for your prayerful discernment in its membership. And for time, I'll be introducing them to you next week. But there's a lot of things going on here in our little part of the kingdom, isn't there? It's an amazing thing to be part of the St. Patrick's Parish family as we celebrate the sacraments joyfully and reverently, as we form intentional disciples, as we learn what it means to evangelize ourselves and others. It's a great time. It's a great time to be here. You know, I'm convinced. And if you need a reminder, by the way, just look at whatever cottonwood tree you see around you <laughs> and think about your parish. Because I'm convinced that if there were cottonwoods in first century Palestine, would it, Jesus would have used them instead of the mustard seed to illustrate the kingdom of God. You know, it only takes the tiniest seed of faith to make a great saint. It only takes one parish family to change the world, or at least this little part of the world here in 99504.